Acts chapter 6, please. For those of you who are visiting with us, we are working through the book of Acts. And uh, we have made two parts out of Acts 6. And this is the second part. Each week, pastors around the world have to endure what is oftentimes referred to as the sweet torture of sermon preparation. Now, I say that with gravity um, because you, we, we want to study the Bible, but it, it, it does take work to try to understand rightly a text. Sermon uh, um, creation may not be hard, but to endeavor to get it right may very well be hard. That's why it's torture. But there is sweetness and joy in that rose. <clears throat> They must not just understand a text, but they have to at least try to develop a sermon on, on, a, on, a, on a message or a paragraph or a paper that God wrote. So imagine God writes a theological treatise on something. And he says, I want you <laughs> to elaborate on that. It's pretty daunting. It's pretty humiliating because he's the primary audience. But that pastor also, that preacher also knows that no matter how correct his understanding of that text, no matter how well, um, he may present that text, and no matter how spiritually powerful, if I could put it that way, it may be there is going to be somebody or bodies who take exception to it for some reason or other. Such is the case with our text Today, look with me, if you would, at Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. And will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I expect that Stephen delivered... Um, great ministry to the people he was ministering to. And in chapter 7, 
we'll see Stephen reiterate what his hearers, this council, already know. And everything that he'll say in it, you can look back into the book of Genesis and Exodus and see that he was right. And you would think that the council will say, well, man, Stephen, you got it right. We agree. Preach on, brother. No. Just let the cat out of the bag. They're going to kill him. They're going to kill him because he preached the Bible. What a shame. Father, I ask you to meet with us this morning. May your word do your work. Whether it be pleasing or painful, would you please prick our hearts individually and corporately, giving us what we need to bring honor and glory to you. Please. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What we see here with Stephen's deliverance to this council is the third time this has happened in the book of Acts. If you've been working with us through the book so far, then you've noticed, you may remember, that Peter and John were brought before the religious leaders. Then the twelve, as a group, were brought before the religious leaders. And here now, Stephen is brought before these religious leaders. And then we'll see later on towards the end of the book of Acts where the same thing happens to the Apostle Paul. When I read this text, I, I, I thought about it many, many, many times. I tried to envision what's going on here because, you know, it, it looks pretty short, pretty orderly. Um, and, and I tried to think about the, the people and, and the way they were responding to Peter. And I remembered back in the 80s, <clears throat> I was stationed down in Panama. And some of you may remember, um, um, there, was a, there was a guy down there named Manuel Noriega. And <clears throat> he wasn't a communist, but he was, uh, he was a man for money, and the Panama Canal was lucrative. And um, he caused the United States a lot of problems. And he was, um, he was a money man, and, um, but, he, but, but he wielded the people. And so it, 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 one time, Wendy and I, when we first got married and got her down there, we were living in downtown Panama City on a road called El Cangrejo. For those of you who speak Spanish, you know that means the crab. And we could hear on a regular basis these, what they call demonstrations. And what would happen is that the, um, the, the Panamanians, what they call the guads, it was like the policemen and the military, they would drum up the people, especially around the university, which we weren't far from. And they would, they would get these people, and essentially it was like the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming. And, and, and the people banded together and they demonstrated. They called it a demonstration. Sometimes violent, sometimes not so much. But that's what they did. They, they, and, and, and I say that because it's like in their zeal, they were easily aroused. I appreciate people's zeal. I'm a zealous person. I can get pretty animated pretty quickly. But when that animation is wrong and it gets out of control, it can become troublesome. And sometimes that euphoria gets in our minds and it clouds our thinking. And we're not thinking rationally anymore. We're not thinking logically. We're not thinking, what is the truth? But we're acting on how we feel or what we think about what we believe. 
I told my Sunday school class this morning, we're talking about membership. And some of you know one of my favorite words is objective. We should think objectively. Our text is a pretty interesting one. I want to just point out a few things very quickly here this morning. First of all is Stephen's conduct. Luke is writing this book, remember, to Theophilus. He wants him to know a variety of things. And in verse 8, he says, Stephen, who we just saw was one of the deacons in verses 1 through 7, right? Full of grace and power was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Now, if you just had that, wouldn't you think, you know, period, praise God, good things are happening, woohoo, the gospel is progressing, people are getting saved, people are getting healed, this is wonderful. That's not what happened. We got the period, but that's not where it ends. He was doing all these great things, and then, here's our transition, some people didn't like it. Some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. So here Stephen is doing all these wonderful things. Things that maybe many of us would, you know, love to do. Or we would love to see done. And you would think people would be excited about this, but, but they're not excited. They're not excited at all. What Stephen is doing, though, is he is fulfilling Jesus' uncontradictable wisdom. Because Jesus told his disciples that they were going to speak from the Father. In Luke chapter 21 and verse 15, Jesus said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to contradict. In Matthew 10 verse 20, he said, For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So here is a, a clear fulfillment of exactly what Jesus was talking about. And I would submit to you that it is very possible for you to have the same experience when you speak the word of truth to people. You are speaking God's word. But, but it's interesting when you look at Stephen and, and, and Luke gives this this picture of him, this commentary, and he tells us a couple of things about Luke. He tells us a couple more in verse 5, but here he says that Stephen was full of grace and power. Verse 5, faith and the Spirit. So here he's just doing wonderful things. He's a powerful guy. He's gracious. He's apparently not offensive in his demeanor. He's a benevolent, merciful minister ministering to the people. And you would think no one would have a problem with that. He was irresistible. His argument could not be refuted. I, I love facts. I love facts. And, and, but everybody doesn't love facts. What's he all saying? Don't confuse me with the facts. Right? You've heard that before. There's some people that don't like facts. You know it as a Christian. You can share the word of God with people. And there's some people who, though they can't refute it, they don't want to hear it. Haven't you seen those people? But not only was he irresistible, he had a divine impression. There was something about Stephen, that Luke was told. So, so for those of you who don't know, Luke is writing to a guy named Theophilus. We find it in the book of uh, Luke was written to Theophilus. And, and Luke wasn't there here in, in Acts 6. He was told about this, right? 
And, and, and what he's told is, hey, Luke, man, you should have seen Stephen. He had like the face of an angel. Now, what the face of an angel means, I don't know. But we have seen that kind of terminology used in the Old Testament before. It's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily mean that his face glowed like Moses, but it could have. But that's not what Luke says. But he apparently did have a peaceful demeanor about him. When you're right, there's, there's a certain amount of peace in that. Even when people are upset with you, right? It's nice to be right. And secondly, we see contrasted to that, the freedmen's conduct. There's an old saying, I like it, I've used it a million times it seems like, forgive my hyperbole. Jealousy digs the mud that envy throws at success. You should write that down and commit it to memory as well. Jealousy digs the mud that envy throws at success. I heard that from a preacher, Curtis Hudson, decades ago. What you see here in this contrast is that because the freedmen can't withstand the power and the wisdom with which he was speaking, they decided to take an alternative route. If you can't beat them, beat them. If you can't beat them in argumentation, beat them up. Now, if you're breathing and you're of any age at all, you probably have entered into some situation with somebody at some time in the past, and maybe you were arguing with them, and I don't necessarily mean heated, but you have one opinion, they had another, and you were going back and forth, and you just couldn't out do their, their wisdom, their facts, their information? Do you remember the, the pressure you start feeling? The anger that starts swelling up? Because you're not going to lose this argument. Even if you have to be confounded with the facts. We do that. Every one of us can do that. And that's what we see happening here, we don't know a whole lot about these freedmen. The, the um, most popular opinion seems to be that these were people who had their own synagogue, but these, these freedmen, these people, were um, the, the people of or ancestors of people who had been in slavery through Jews, through the Assyrian and the Babylonian captivity, captivities well before Jesus came to earth. And, and, and those people, because birds of a feather flock together, right? You know, oh yeah, your grandparents were slaves too, oh mine were too, and you know, we need a new synagogue, let's all build one. I don't know what happened, but that seems to be the idea. But they collected other people apparently as well. And it's nice to have a gang whenever we want to argue with somebody, right? You, you, you know, there's strength in numbers. That's what happens here. We see, I mean, we really see human nature going on right here, don't we? We want to be careful to not do that. So Luke tells us about these other people. In verse... Nine, he says that not only did you have the freedmen, but you also had those of the Cyrenians and of those of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia. And all these people decided, well, we don't like Stephen either. That's what it looks like. Now, this is actually a biblical model as well. Because remember, later on in Acts, we'll see it, when Paul is standing before the leaders of the day, and he, 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 he's, he's being condemned, and, and he realizes, hey, there's a bunch of Pharisees and a bunch of Sadducees in here, 
And he knows that the Sadducees do not believe in a resurrection. And I can't help but say it. That's why they were so sad, you see. So Paul picks up on it. And wisely, he decides, I'm going to create a division among even them. And he says, for the testimony of the resurrection am I called into account. And everybody freaked out. The Pharisees against the Sadducees. And Luke tells us because the Sadducees didn't believe in angels, spirits, or the resurrection. But until then, they had come together to condemn Paul. You've seen that before, haven't you? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's what's partially going on here. But notice what they do. They apparently see the zeal of some people. In verse 11, they secretly instigated men. And, and this could be taken two ways. It appears that these men that they were instigating were saying, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So in my mind, this is how I pick it up. And I'm not saying this is exactly what happened. This is Dale's understanding of this text. Because Luke doesn't even tell us exactly. That these people are upset at what Stephen's doing. And they hear rumblings from some of these other people who say these things. And they may have said, this is our opportunity. Let's rouse everybody up. Let's instigate this crowd. I'm thinking back again to Panama. They stirred up the people. When they got a good frenzy going on, they seized Stephen. After seizing Stephen, they set up false witnesses to condemn him. But these freedmen didn't point out all of Stephen's positives. They were out for blood. They dismissed his grace, his faith, his power, and God the Holy Spirit. They discounted, apparently, his ministry work, all the wonders and signs that he was doing, because they were zealous for their view of the law. And in spite of all that good, they condemned him. These efforts were intended to bolster the points against Stephen. Their frustration was growing because they could not refute Stephen. Thirdly, this is a great contrast. These acts against Stephen are much like what we saw happen to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There's probably, as you read this, an element of familiarity with something that's happened before. And it is what happened to Christ. Just before his crucifixion, the crowd was stirred up in Mark chapter 15, verses 11 through 14. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him, Barabbas, released. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you called the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! They're zealous for Jesus' death. They're out for blood against the man who only raised the dead, caused the blind to see, was gracious, merciful, and kind. Like we see Stephen emulating. Not only did we see this contrast, we see perversion of the accusations made against him. And it's the very same ones. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus tells us why he came. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
Jesus made it very clear what he was doing. There should be no perversion of that. But ladies and gentlemen, remember, don't confuse me with the facts. I want to believe a certain thing, and I'm going to believe that certain thing, no matter what you say. That's what's happening here. And in John chapter 2, Jesus says in verse 19, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up. And the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple and building. And John tells us, but he was talking about himself. And so he did. Three days later, he did. Yet even after Jesus' death, and these people could see it, the temple still stood. Now you would think, if they're thinking he's going to destroy the temple, but now he's dead and supposedly resurrected, but I still see the temple, that must not be what he meant. Because the temple still stands. Still, they make the accusation against Stephen. Couldn't they literally have seen the brick and mortar of it? Thirdly, we find these false accusations in Matthew chapter 26. This is another contrast, verses 59 through 62. Matthew tells us, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. These are killers. Remember, we've talked about that before. These Jews, they're killers. They're bloodthirsty. But they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two, and we see that again with Stephen, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And Jesus remained silent. And they crucified him. They stirred up the crowd, we see. They gave false accusation in spite of Jesus' real meaning. And and then they killed him. And again, letting the cat out of the bag a little bit, you can just go read the end of chapter 7 of Acts. They're going to kill Stephen too. Remember when we were talking about Peter and John coming before the council and the apostles coming before the council? Even before this happened with Stephen, those men came before that council knowing they might die. Probably expecting to die because Jesus had told them they were going to die for him. They're going to be his witnesses, his martyrs. Ladies and gentlemen, they entered into their faith with this reality. And I would submit to you that reality still applies. That's what you've signed up for. For the people to resist Stephen in spite of the unusual display by himself points to their hard-hearted prejudice. Their religion was intent on denying the obvious and undeniable. I told my Sunday school class this morning that, you know, sometimes we believe things that are popular but aren't biblical. And I just gave an example. I'll give it, I'll give it again. Uh, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And somebody says, oh, that's the simplest form of a church. No, that's what C.I. Schofield said was the simplest form of a church. That's not the simplest form of a church. That was talking about church discipline. But you ask most people, what was Jesus talking about? Oh, he's talking about simple. When me and my buddies get together at the hunting lodge, we're a church, amen, brother. We don't need to go to a church and give and sing no no no. we're 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 worshiping jesus in a deer stand now i'm not saying you can't worship jesus in a deer stand but i am saying that's a perversion of that text and it ought not be done objective 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 
We saw this happen to the apostles earlier, and we'll see it happen to Paul. You've heard me say before, you will do what you will to do. I would suggest you memorize that too. Because it's so true of humanity. It's so true of me. I will do what I really will to do. And you're not stopping me. So the question becomes, is our will God's will? Do I want what God wants? Or have I become God? Cain, right? We run the risk of being this kind of people. We're often tempted to submit to culture, our religion, our prejudices, and other things despite the presentation of objective biblical truth. Let's not be foolish. Fourthly, we see the cautions, some cautions. Their resistance to Stephen was actually their resistance to God. If you'll notice there in verse 10, they could not withstand the power and the wisdom, or excuse me, the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Look at that word spirit. It's capital S. It's a person. They could not withstand God the Holy Spirit with which Stephen was speaking. Amen? It's what Luke just told us. Many of the accusers, people, and the Sanhedrin may have realized their error in 70 A.D., which really wasn't far from here. By the time this happened, you're talking three decades or less. By the time Luke wrote it, it was even less. So imagine with me if you're one of those those freedmen or one of those other synagogue worshipers 70 A.D. comes and that temple is destroyed, but Jesus didn't do it. Do you think back and say, oh, wow, Stephen was right. Jesus must have been the Messiah. I don't know the answer to that question because the Bible doesn't tell us. But I hope so. And I hope that when we preach the truth, though people may not accept it now, maybe later on they will. Right? That's why we, one of the reasons we preach. Because God's word does not return to him void, Isaiah 55, 11. You don't need to win everybody to Jesus today. You just share the gospel today. And let the spirit of God and the word of God do the work of God. With the consistency and witness and conviction by the apostles and Stephen, the movement was obviously advancing. The Word of God is advancing. In fact, your being here today is a demonstration of that reality. It got here. It got to you because of them. How did they react to that realization? I don't know. Maybe some did get converted, but it cost Stephen his life. Was it worth it, you think? Think about that for a second. If, if, if people did end up getting converted to Christ, was it worth Stephen's death? Let me put it in higher terms. If people got saved, at least to those saved people, was it worth Jesus' death? Yeah. You testify to that. So what's Luke's point? That godly men preach Christ. And those men will be speaking with the Spirit just as Jesus taught that they would. That those men, those people, will be resisted 
even against the resistor's knowledge and experience. Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy. They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And that the witness of Christ, because of it, many may suffer. How can I worship the Lord in relation to this text? What Jesus said would happen to believers did. And it will. He is and always will be right. And the message applies to us one day as well, possibly. That believing in and submitting to Jesus' words gives great confidence even in persecution. You can die confidently in Christ. Even at the hands of ungodly men. That a right understanding of Jesus' teachings is essential to following him. No matter the preacher's personality, power, content, or conduct. Stephen had it all together. Stephen had it all right. He was still rejected. And he still died. Don't think that you're so good that if you just say it right, everybody will believe it and you'll be delivered. That's probably just the opposite of the truth. That the right understanding will not convince everyone despite the facts. So who's really on trial here? It looks like Stephen's on trial. Right? I don't think so. You know who's really on trial here? All those people who were speaking against Stephen. All those people who knew what the Bible says, that objective truth, and they resisted it. Because they'd rather have their power. They'd rather have the people. They'd rather have their religion. They weren't going to submit to Christ. Stephen was no doubt not on trial here. Yet the trial continues, even to this day. People are still faced with this issue. You and I may very well one day be faced with this issue or this opportunity. Where will those people side? Where will we side? Where will we stand with established religion? I'm a fill in the blank. Or with faith in Christ? And more importantly, most importantly, where do you stand? Where do you stand in relation to who Jesus is? Do you believe him to be the Savior? The God-man? The price paid for your soul? Because that's what the Bible teaches. So you should decide where you stand. The Apostle Paul was testifying before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 much like Stephen is here. And he stated in verses 27 through 29, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And this should be on our tongues. Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. We'll pray, and Todd's going to come and lead us in a song, and then Tom's going to close us in prayer.